change the phase of matter. Uh, we're going to pick up right there and, and, and start with kind of some definitions. When we go from intermolecular forces of a certain strength, let's say solids, very strong intermolecular forces, and we decrease the strength of those forces, we make them weaker and weaker and weaker. As we do that, and we change from one phase to another, we call that, you know, very accurately, a phase change. And we've got a couple of specific names for them. If we're going from solid to liquid, we call it melting. Um, if we're going from liquid to solid, we call it freezing. If we're, if we're going from liquid to gas, we call it vaporization. We also call it evaporation. Um, if, we, um, if we're going from gas to liquid, we call it condensation. And then much more rarely, we have something called sublimation and deposition. Sublimation is what you see if you have something like dry ice. Dry ice goes directly from a solid to a gas under earth pressure. So, so we're not going to see it under normal earth conditions as a liquid because once those molecules kind of break away from each other, they, they don't really flow off. Um, they, they, they don't like each other enough to kind of hang out under the current pressure. So um, we can represent these things in something called a heating curve. Heat is a type of energy right? Heat is an amount of kinetic energy that we can store inside of a particular piece of matter. Um, and heat and temperature, as much as we think of them as coinciding, and they do most of the time, if we add heat, generally, the temperature of something increases. Um, however, at specific times, when we are undergoing a phase change, we have to add a bunch of heat to a material, uh, to break those intermolecular forces specifically, and that does not increase the temperature of the particles, right? So if, if we look at this section here, between solid and liquid, we have that flat area at zero degrees centigrade. So what we're looking at here on this graph is a heating curve of water, right? Below zero degrees centigrade, it's solid. At zero degrees centigrade, we have particles that are now starting to flow and we have particles that are still held on together um, in a solid. At that time, during phase change, the temperature of that material does not change. All of the energy that we are investing in that matter is actually going to break those interparticulate forces, not toward increasing the speed of any particular particle. And that's really pretty cool, right? That's why um, if we're going from something like a liquid to a gas, right, if we're boiling water, I can't I can tell you the exact temperature of that water, right? The exact temperature of that water is going to be 100 degrees. Always, always, always. That's why it's so useful for cooking, right? If I, if I want my spaghetti to be cooked well, right? I, I don't want to make it too hot and I, and I don't want to keep it too cool. If I boil something, then it's going to be at exactly 100 degrees for as long as that water exists, right? So, so long as I have any liquid in that pot and we have some of that liquid as, as converting to gas, the rest of that liquid is going to be at 100 degrees. Does that make sense to everybody? Is anybody who's like a, a chocolatier, anybody who does stuff with chocolate, uses a double boiler, All right? Chocolate is really, really hard to work with because if you get it just a little too hot, it burns uh, and becomes bitter. If you don't get it hot enough, it doesn't melt, right? So what you'll end up doing is using like a, a, a bowl of water and you'll put a smaller bowl inside of that and you can melt the chocolate inside that smaller bowl because you know exactly the temperature that that smaller bowl is going to get. It's going to get to be exactly 100 degrees. Is that kind of cool? Um, so let's talk about kind of what's happening in terms of, of these materials. Uh, when we look from solid to liquid, right? These, these particles are, are increasing in their, in their energy. They're starting to vibrate faster and faster and faster. And then um, when we go to melting, what's happening is that some of those particles are breaking off and they're starting to slide around. That breaking away takes energy. Right? Just like pulling two magnets apart takes energy. So as we're making that transition, there's no increase in the general speed of the solid. So it's going to stay at zero degrees until 
all of that solid material has melted. So they're shaking faster and faster and faster until eventually they're shaking fast enough that they can flow over one another. And I have this really interesting video um, of something called liquefaction that was really big uh, in the in like the 50s. Right? It was a huge terror in the 50s. Uh, and you'll see what I'm talking about in just a second. So what I have here is a, a box of sand. Then they bubble air through it. And what you're seeing is that the bubbles of air push those sand particles apart from each other, right? Allowing them to, as they fall back down, flow over one another, just like in a liquid. So what we really have here is not technically a phase change, but it's a really, really good representation of what a phase change might look like on the molecular level, right? So if you imagine every grain of these, this fine sand as being a different molecule, right? And that air being energy added, we are watching something go from a solid to a liquid. And you can see that it's again a solid in their hands when they lift it up out of that air, right? Because it is all allowed to settle. And then they stop the air. And once again, it's a solid. Does that, are there questions or concerns about this? How do we feel about this kind of phase change status? Okay, then that same thing is true as we go from a liquid to a gas. In a liquid, we have particles kind of slowly sliding over one another, but they're still hold, held onto enough that if, if they wanted to escape gravity, it would have to be the entire mass of that particle, right? Um, all, of those, all of those molecules would, would have to escape at once because they're still held on to each other. Um, as it heats up and heats up and heats up, what's happening is those molecules are sliding, 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 and then we might have one collision where those collision and one of them rockets off, right, upward. And if it rockets up and away, what's happening is it's actually breaking all of its intermolecular forces. Now it's a lone molecule of that type in the atmosphere surrounded by other uh, molecules that, that don't really like hanging out with each other very much. So we have something going from a liquid that slides over each other very easily to a gas that uh, doesn't, doesn't stick to any particles at all. Now, interestingly enough, we can, temperature is not the only way that we can manipulate phase, right? It's a good way that we can manipulate phase. It's an easy way that we can manipulate phase. If we add heat to a system, we increase the, the motion of those particles. And if we increase that motion enough, we can break those intermolecular forces. Another way that we can force particles together is using something called pressure. Pressure is simply a force over a certain amount of area, right? So if I have a container and I have a, a lid that fits that container perfectly, inside that container, I have something like a gas, right? If I push that lid down and those particles are not allowed to um, escape, eventually I'm gonna push those particles close enough together that they're forced to interact with each other, right? So I can force something from a gaseous state into a liquid state by, by increasing the pressure enough. Now, what I have to do here is, you know, obviously those particles are going to be moving the same as they were before. So I have to somehow let the heat out of that system. Um, I, I can't have them moving really fast and also as a liquid, right? Those intermolecular forces just won't hold on to each other. It'll just be a really, really compact liquid. Um, eventually it would break my container, but we can decrease this, the, the space between these particles enough that intramolecular forces start to enact and glom these particles together. We just have to, uh, again, alleviate the temperature. Uh, we can represent this kind of cool interaction, this kind of, um, this kind of change in interaction using something called a phase diagram. Um, let me go back to this slide just one more second. Let's talk about the application of this idea.
if you guys have ever seen like an instant rice, like a rice or or like um, a, a Spanish rice or like, you know, a rice that comes in a box, if you look on the back of that rice box, you'll see that it has two different cook times. One cook time is for people who are at sea level. The second cook time is for people who are, you know, at like Denver, like a mile above sea level. And that's because the atmospheric pressure, right? That's the pressure of the air pushing down on the water is decreased as you move away from the earth, right? Until eventually you get to space and the atmospheric pressure is zero because there's no atmosphere up there, right? So it's like an asymptotic you know, curve as we go from a lot of atmosphere down at, at sea level, less and less atmosphere up at like Denver. And if I'm boiling water there, it actually boils more easily in Denver because the pressure pushing down on those particles is less. So if there's less pressure pushing down, that means individual water molecules have less resistance to jump up and escape the rest of that water glob. So, so the temperature of boiling water at Denver is like 93 degrees centigrade as opposed to 100 degrees centigrade. And that's because there's less pressure there. If there is more pressure, let's say, you know, you're in a, a submarine, right, a Navy submarine, you might have to get water to like 120 degrees in order for uh, that water to actually boil off. Because a greater increase in pressure is going to force those particles closer together for longer, and you're going to have to get them moving faster in order to allow them to escape. Right, so pressure really does matter in terms of phase change. We can also do some kind of weird and cool stuff. If I have, um, uh, uh, a solid, right? Something like a carbon dioxide. And I want it to, to become a liquid, right? I can't do that because the pressure on earth is never going to be high enough, right? It's going to go from here to here at all temperatures, right? I'm never going to be able to, to jump this line because my pressure is all the way down here at earth, right? So here I've got my carbon dioxide, right? I increase my temperature, bang, suddenly it's a gas, right? If I were to increase the pressure, if I were to put that in some kind of pressure chamber, I could actually increase the temperature to the point where it would become a liquid, right? A liquid carbon dioxide, something that's kind of cool. Uh, I have some dry ice coming, so I will show you a demonstration of this um, in just a bit, whenever that dry ice gets here. You know, shipping is all weird right now. But we can kind of manipulate the phase using both pressure and temperature. Right, so if I have a really low pressure, it's really easy for material to become gaseous, right? And if I have a really low pressure, really nothing that depends, so these lines will change depending on the material. But, but you know, in this case, if I have a really low pressure, I would never get a liquid, right? So if I have a really high pressure and a really low temperature, I'm gonna be a solid. If I have a really low pressure and a high temperature, I'm gonna be a gas. And liquid is kind of this beautiful middle ground where I have some amount of pressure and some amount of temperature. I don't wanna talk about these. All right, so what I want you guys to do now, that's my last slide. Oh, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it with you. So, so here what I have is a FET demonstration that allows me to kind of manipulate the pressure and the temperature of a material. And we'll see kind of if I heat it up, we can kind of assume what's gonna happen right now. It's a solid and now it's slowly becoming a liquid right? it had a def it had a definite shape, right? And it had a definite volume. And as I heat it up and it slowly becomes a liquid, right? What we're seeing here is that those particles are starting to slide over one another. Right now, what we have is a is a definite volume, right? It still takes up only a certain amount of space, but we have an indefinite shape. The shape of that material can change, and I can pump more uh, water molecules in there if I'd like. As I pump more water molecules in there, eventually, yeah, there we go. I'm increasing the pressure enough that we get some of those materials escaping into that container. I can also increase the pressure kind of force those materials back down. You see how I kind of force them back into a liquid state? I can increase the pressure here. 
I increase it enough, I think I can force them into a relatively solid state, right? Because remember, a solid state just means a definite temperature. Uh, I'm, I'm reaching the critical point here. If I go too far down, bang, I explode my device, right? So uh, I have this on Google Classroom for you guys. Uh, if you wanted to mess around with it, it's, I, I think it's awfully fun to kind of mess around with these material and, and really see how these molecules behave at given temperatures. I'm gonna decrease this to this, the point where these you know, start to condense, right? You see that even those atmospheric uh, water molecules, these ones up in the up in space, kind of start to glom onto each other, and they're moving so slowly that they're not bouncing around against uh, uh, particles in the air. Can increase the amount of water in here. I'm going to cool it back down, and we're going to form another ice cube down there in the bottom left, or sorry for you guys, the bottom right. How do you guys feel about this? Why don't you guys throw me the thumbs up if you're still with me? Nice, nice. <laughs> I, I, you gotta do love the, the physical thumbs up. Okay, so a couple of the key points that I'd like you guys to really focus on today. Um, liquids, or sorry, solids, definite shape, definite volume. Liquids, definite volume, indefinite shape, gas, indefinite both, right? Uh, secondly, we can represent the change in phase using something called a heating curve. And heating curves are, are pretty cool because we can see at phase changes, you know, if we have any angle at all, right, it ends up being an increase in temperature. If we have a flat line, it ends up being that, that matter during a phase change. We have melting, we have boiling, we have evaporation, we have vaporization. Those are all the same thing. Uh, liquid, gas, and solid, that's kind of where we go with the three. If we go straight from a solid to a gas, that's called sublimation and deposition. Um, we can manipulate this matter using pressure, right? So if I had, uh, if I increase the pressure on, like, let's say, ooh, if you guys have ever used something like a pressure cooker, right? You can cook stuff faster in a pressure cooker because the water boils at a higher temperature, right? Because we're increasing the pressure of that vessel so the water can get to a higher temperature before it starts to boil. So you end up being able to manipulate the, the temperature at which something boils using pressure. Questions about that? I think that that's probably the one that is the most like cognitive disconnect about how material really exists. One more quick example. Let's say, you know, I'm cooking spaghetti. Um, I, I throw some salt in my water. I, I let it get to a boil. It's at 100 degrees because that's when water boils. Uh, my dog escapes the backyard. I have to take 10 minutes running him down. Um, you know, I finally get him and I drag him back to my house. I check the water. Uh, anybody know what temperature that water is going to be? Bueller? 